I am Austin Lugo. I'm Andrew Harp. This is With Nothing to Say. Let's talk about Scream. Before we get into this week's film, next week we're going to be watching Fallen Angels, the director of In the Mood for Love. This is the only film by the director I have seen. Of course, In the Mood for Love is one of my favorite films. Have you seen any of his other work, Andrew? Yeah, I love In the Mood for Love, too. I like Chunking Express as well. There's only two I've seen. Yeah, but they're good. Awesome. Well, in celebration of Scream 6 in theaters now, wherever you see movies, we decided to watch Scream. You've seen this movie... Like three or four times, yeah. Okay, you've seen it a couple of times before. Have you seen all six? Well, other than the new one? Well, I might go see the new one, but I don't know if I will or not. But yeah, at this point, I've seen, yeah, the first five movies. But I I might go see the sixth movie in theaters. I don't know. I'll think about it. I haven't heard good things, so it doesn't really (laughs) encourage me to go see it. Um, So I think I might just wait. I don't really want to contribute to the the amount of money. It doesn't really matter, you know, either way. Whether I I see it or not, it doesn't make a big difference. But (laughs) but yeah, I have, uh, I've seen them all pretty much great Wes Craven of course did this one and he did the first four right no he did he directed all okay like the first four yeah that's incredible in your opinion Andrew what are the uh three rules of every horror movie I forget what they were again it's uh (laughs) don't oh yeah yeah don't oh yeah yeah don't have sex and don't um don't drink or you know like do drugs or anything like that because they're sins and the third one was um oh yeah don't say uh, I'll be right back because you're not gonna be right back yeah 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 as the Jimmy Kennedy character says Mm -hmm. and i will say you know in watching the movie again i watched this on paramount plus and paramount plus is great um because for some reason they have a lot of their older movies in 4k streamable in 4k while hbo max like i i use that one a lot but the only movies that they stream have streamable in 4k are newer movies typically they don't really have any other like older movies in 4k even if they are available in 4k not every old movie is streamable in 4K. So this is the first time seeing it in 4K and it looked really good. Yeah. I thought it looked uh, beautiful. Is that where you watched it? I sure did. And it looks fantastic. It looks really good. I thought I thought it looked I thought it looked um I thought it looked punched up uh, even more. Yeah. I thought it looked a little bit less drab than uh, of previous viewing, so I was happy with it. Yeah, very great looking movie, very bright, very sunny, a lot of natural daylight used in this film, which is always fun to see because that's not Mm -hmm. typical of your horror genre film so it's kind of fun to see stuff kind of the middle of the day also some really great world building going on here i mean he really creates where are they supposed to i I know they're in california but some small coastal town or coastal-ish town that was the other thing i noticed too when um when i rewatched it today like there's some Mm -hmm. shots in the beginning where she goes to her house and she's standing and you notice in the back right behind, right behind her house are these rolling, beautiful hills. And I was like, oh, I didn't, I never really noticed that. I never really <laughs> noticed that they're just kind of like out in the country, look like very yeah. like California country mm-hmm. area. So I noticed that too on this watch as well, that they're just kind of like out there, like I feel like these like beautiful rolling hills behind Neve Campbell. Yeah, it's just probably somewhere in California. <laughs> I'm guessing it looks like California. It probably is somewhere in California. But this movie, I mean, it just jumps right into it. There's no... Yeah, it's great. There's no waiting. There's no little Mm -hmm. beginning. It's just right into the movie, right into Scream. Maybe the most famous, um, you know, one of the most famous opening scenes of all time, you know, Mm -hmm. the uh, the murder of Drew Barrymore, which I like the opening scene because, like, you know, Drew Barrymore is, of course, very famous. Like, it's not like she's not famous. She's very famous at this point. And they kill her immediately, which... You know, she's like probably, you know, a lot of people were probably expecting, you know, like, oh, Drew Barrymore, you know, she's great. She's going to be in the movie, you know, she's probably on the poster and everything. And then yeah. you go see it and like immediately, immediately, uh, they kill her <laughs> in the fantastic <laughs> opening scene. They're just flipping it around, Andrew. They're, they're turning horror yeah, on its head. It. They're flipping it. Yeah, dude. I love the calls, you know, the famous calling from inside the house and all that stuff. Yeah, all that shit. Wes Craven, he loves his horror movies. He fucking loves it. It's his life. One thing you got to know, though, is that like this movie was not written by Wes Craven. It was written by a guy named Kevin right. Williamson. All these movies are written by Kem- Kevin Williamson. And that's kind of the thing about these movies that maybe kind of puts me off a little bit. 
Um, when I say these What's movies, that? I mean like the first four because they're all written by Kevin Williamson and they're all directed by Wes Craven. Mm. Sometimes the writing is a little moronic. <laughs> it's a little nerdy, I think. You know, I don't think Williamson's like a bad writer. And I think ultimately, I think it's like good. But I think it needs a lot of work, which thankfully, Wes Craven directed all these movies. So therefore, he's able to elevate them by taking the material and I think he elevates it to the level that where it needs to be, where he treats it very, very seriously. Absolutely. I think these movies in the wrong hands could very easily be bad movies. Yeah, they could be really bad. It has some of the uh, the elements of, and I see what you mean, kind of his writing being moronic. I think with the wrong actors or the wrong director, yeah. for sure. I mean, really, if you get any of these things wrong, I think Scream wouldn't have worked. And so... You know, hats off to this Wes Craven guy. He uh, he seems to be knowing what he's doing. Yeah, and I think he honestly nails it every movie. He's just able to like really like he just adds such like a, a professional element to the movies, like within the directing itself. I think the movie is funny, but it's also serious, like when it needs to be. And I think too, like the casting of the of these movies, and especially in the first one, is perfect. Yeah, Scream is kind of like like a RoboCop in my opinion, where. Yeah, like the meta shit in the in the kind of the subtext of everything, you know, you could like read it so many different ways and you could go on and on and on forever and ever and ever. But also it's just kind of like a nice 90s horror movie, just kind of like how Robocop is a nice, exciting action movie. Like yeah. Scream is just kind of like a good, very 90s styles and 90s actors and it's very much kind of like in that uh, world. Um, so you can get, just kind of like watch it and vibe out and not worry too much about like, oh, wow, I wonder what, you know, this, you know, you don't really have to like, I, I think even if you didn't know anything about horror movies, like if you never watched Halloween or Nightmare on Elm Street or Prom Night or mm -hmm. any of that stuff, I think you would still you get it. be excited by it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because I would say by this point in time, mid to late 90s horror films are kind of ingrained in the zeitgeist zeitgeist yeah the public consciousness especially today too like these are just you know you could have never seen a horror movie in your entire life and you still you still get it like you still yeah you still know i mean maybe yeah and the funny thing about scream 2 though is that like at this point like people didn't care too much about slashers obviously they're very uh -huh. famous movies at this point but with the success of Scream, which was a huge success, it kind of revitalized that. So more, it, it started another wave of like slasher movies right. and horror movies around this time as well. But of course, that opening scene, the great Drew Barrymore just brutally murdered. I mean, she's running around. She's fighting for her life. Her boyfriend's gutted. See all the, the guts and gore. No one films around a house better than Wes Craven. Like the way that yes. he is able to like direct around like a, just a house set is like amazing like i don't know like the movie doesn't like have any like crazy locations really like everything is like pretty ordinary there's also no like maybe you could make the argument that there is but there's no supernatural element either it's just guys and people but he's able to like i don't know he's just really able to heighten everything to make it feel like it's out of the ordinary yeah Wes craven may be the master of making the ordinary extraordinary and his ability to shoot at locations and create a sense of a map, a sense of where you are it is really fantastic yeah. because I think one of the things that horror films especially tend to struggle with is you never have a sense of location. You never really understand where they are inside the house, inside a school, wherever they are. And so when they're running from place to place, it can be kind of confusing where you're not really sure what's going on. And sometimes filmmakers will sort of cheat that way, right? They'll be able to go out of a room you didn't know about or go out a door you didn't know out of. Right. But the masterful work of Wes Craven is from the moment Drew Barrymore answers that phone, she's walking around the house, right? A lot of wonders, yeah. a lot of seeing, okay, here's where the kitchen is. Here's where the dining room is. Here's where this room is. So you know where everything is. You know where the front door is. You know where the back door is. So then when she's eventually chased by Scream, by Ghostface, there's this sense of fear because you know where everything is. You know how this place is laid out. And so it I would argue it intensifies everything to another degree. Yeah. And, and then that opening scene, you know, is just like a really great, like just immediately, like you said, you're pulled right into the movie. 
and you're kind of introduced to what the movie is all about where it's kind of doing like a self-referential you know meta thing of course you know it, this is very well established this this kind of movie where there it's a horror movie you're watching a horror movie but the characters in the movie are also aware of other horror movies that came before it so and this is you know this goes on and on and on in the movie and of course, you know, they do that thing where like they ask her, uh, they do the thing where like, who, who was the killer in Friday the 13th? And she's like, it's Jason. It's like, nope. And like that she's like stabbed. And um, I love that scene where she's like uh, trying to run to her parents and like Ghostface is like so close to her. She's like standing by her kind of, yeah. you know what I mean? Like when she's like, it's like, this is scary. It's scary. You know what I mean? Like to like see like kind of like that wide shot where she's running away and Ghostface is literally right there next to her. Like there's no like trickery or anything like that. It's just a guy. Yeah, it's just a guy. And that's that's what I really like about the Ghostface character is he's not this invincible sort of evil villain who just can't be beat. You know, he's not a Hall- Halloween kills sort of villain who's just literally immortal. There's this very real sense of just a man in a costume and you see him struggle, right? You see them punch, you see him get punched and kicked and all this shit. And I think that in a certain degree makes it feel all the real, all the more real because there's a sense that there is just a person here and you're sort of fighting for your life. So when Drew Barrymore fights back, like you think, Oh, is she going to live? Is she going to die? Of course, it's a very very famous scene, but people fight back. Yeah in these movies frequently and in every single one of the movies too unless i'm mistaken the ghost face killer is like someone different that's great i love that like it's always someone new it's always someone different you're always trying to figure out who ghost face is which is kind of the main device that they use in this is trying to figure out who our ghost face is which one of these teenagers yeah. is the real killer and i knew ahead of time who it was but i still had a really fun time like I, I I knew who it was, but I still had a really fun time, like kind of like looking at the movie and thinking like, okay, like what are they doing here? If I'm sitting here and I'm someone who has no idea who it is, how are they, what are they doing here to trick you into thinking that it's not who it is? You know what I mean? So it's really, it's still really fun to rewatch because of those things as well, because, and I guess the writing and the directing goes hand in hand here in this aspect where it, it really does a, it really does a good job at making you second guess yourself on who the ghost face killers are yeah i mean as someone who has never seen it before someone who came into this movie i mean i knew it was scream i knew the people that were in it but i had no idea who ghost face was for whatever reason i had dodged it for the last 26 years of my life i'd never known who ghost face was emily knew that one of the characters was as uh, she referred to him shaggy because that's the only thing she had ever seen. Matthew Lillard. Matthew Lillard, yes. Who's really, really good in this movie, by the way. He's so good. He's very, very good in the movie. I've only ever seen him in the Scooby-Doo movies, so I've never seen him anything else. We started uh, Twin Peaks The Return. He's in that show. That's right. He is in that show. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, he's great. He's incredible in this. So I came into this movie thinking that he was the killer, which... Obviously, there's some twists and turns. Yeah, I was very yeah. surprised, which we'll get into in a bit, but I was very surprised by uh, the twists near the end. But yeah, I mean, the whole time, it, it's always playing off of, you know, who's the killer? And it very much feels like it's bouncing off the typical horror genre of, you know, this kind of person's the killer or that kind of person's the killer. So it's it's fun to see these different nuances of who the killer could be. And of course, you know, it, it, it does revolve around the character of Sidney Prescott, played by Neve Campbell, who's great. A very, very lovely actor. Um, she um she's a great character because it's like um, you know, she has like us she was involved with something a year ago, very similar when her mother was killed. And she uh identified uh, this guy um whose name is escaping me. Cotton, I think is Cotton his name Woods. Is. Is cotton, cotton something cotton. so oh, cotton, cotton weary something. cotton weary yeah. oh yeah <laughs> she identified this guy as the mur- person that murdered um her mom yeah cotton weary play about leaves by the way um i watched the scream 2 i rewatched it a little bit last night and then finished it this morning and uh lee scheiber he's in the sequel and he has a much more um, um oh, a great. fleshed out part 
So uh, he's he's good in it. But yeah, she like points out and uh, Cotton, like he had sex with her mom and stuff. And it's just this whole thing that happened a year ago. So she's very familiar with like the media circus that now that is happening again with the Ghostface murders killing these two students, um, Drew Barrymore and her boyfriend at her house. And it, the, the first anniversary of her mother's murder is coming up. Another great world building point of this film. There's no flashbacks. There's no, you know, cutting back to. No, no. You don't need any of that shit. It's just like, here's this person. She's familiar with it. You know, they handle it pretty well. Like the way they talk about her mother's death. It's never cheesy. I think Wes Craven does a very good job of handling in a way that it never feels too serious nor too silly. I think he provides enough empathy for the character that she knows what's going on. She knows her mom's been murdered, but it never feels saccharine in any way. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, at this point, too, she like um, Gail Weathers, uh, played by Courtney Cox, is Courtney there as Cox. well, which is a great character. She's really good in it. Courtney Cox is amazing in it. <laughs> she plays like an annoying reporter, TV reporter, who spreaded theories about the fact that maybe Sydney falsely identified Cotton as the killer. And that, you know, her mom was, you know, sleeping around, sleeping with her, uh, men, and that someone else just had killed her mother, but it wasn't Cotton. And of course, Sydney is completely, um, she's angry with this. She doesn't feel like her mom would do something like that. She feels right. like Cotton raped her. And, you know, she punches Gail because she's annoying and, you know, it's Great this moment. whole thing. And, and of course, too, you're introduced to all of uh, Sydney's friends. You got Rose McGowan. Uh, she's in it she's really good and of course matthew lillard like we talked about and her um boyfriend who in an earlier scene like sneaks in through her bedroom window and it's kind of like a johnny depp type yes, guy a ski very coach. much so he he very much looks like him yep <laughs> in nightmare before elm street yeah yeah, yeah. and Ni- nightmare in elm street yeah yeah he has all of the johnny depp vibes they might as well have just copy and pasted uh johnny depp and nightmare on elm street but he's really this. good at, he's really good he's honestly, great though like, like johnny depp he's like he's like hanuk in that movie or whatever but skeet ulrich is a much better actor in this movie <laughs> <laughs> completely agree yeah but her boyfriend he wants the he's, sex he's kind but of creepy. she's yeah, not he ready wants to f- <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> yeah 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 he, he wants to do under the shirt stuff and uh sydney won't let him because she's just kind of like she's still like grieving pretty much and so there's that whole scene where, yeah, he sneaks in and they kind of have this thing. And, and then, like I said, they're at the school and the reporters everywhere. And, um, and uh, yeah, like I said, you get um, introduced to everyone. And, you know, it's, 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 up, it's, it's, it's clear up front that from these opening scenes of their friends that Matthew Lillard and Ski Ulrich, their characters are, um, uh, they love movies and horror movies and they keep on referencing them. But then again, mm-hmm. a lot of other characters do as well. Even the Rose yeah. McGowan character. Constantly referencing just tons and tons of horror movies, which is always fun to see. And I love the high school. I think it's a great high school. Like wherever they found yeah, yeah. the school, it's a great looking school. I like the Henry Winkler principal. I did not expect that. I did not expect that. Yeah. I've never seen him. I mean, it's not a serious role, but this is by far the most serious role I've ever seen him in. I mean, he's still silly, but he's in a lot. Yeah, yeah, he's in, he's a, in a lot. lot. He, he, his lines and stuff in it are really funny. Where he's like, "Your principal loves you," like stuff like that. And I like, I like when he, um, he gets killed. I totally forget yes. about that scene where he gets killed. Like, I think every time I've rewatched this movie, I always forget. Like, oh yeah, they just, they just killed that guy. <laughs> it kind of feels complete. It's a, it was very random and out of place because he's not like a teenager. I don't know. He doesn't really have like much of an impact on the movie, but they just kill him anyway, just because whatever. No, I, I love know. it. They kill a lot of people in the movie. <clears throat> a lot of t- people do be getting killed. But uh, speaking of the principal, I love when he catches those two kids that are wearing the ghost face masks and he expels them. Perfect scene. That is a perfect yeah, scene. I love that. Yeah, because like, yeah, there's people running around like trying to scare <laughs> people with the ghost face mask because they learn that the they learn that the costume is like um you can just buy it at any store it's just like a which i don't know costume, which, I, which I, I understand that this is you know since the scream movies this is of course a very popular but yeah. i remember like dressing up as the ghost face as a kid going trick-or-treating yeah. i don't know about you but i did yeah, yeah yeah oh yeah but i never watched the movies never like not until probably college honestly but i thought it was cool and scary it's a scary costume yeah i think it was a 
it's a great costume. The ghost face is it's perfect. It's the perfect face. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. I like when he's like, you guys are expelled. And they're like, what? And he's like, okay. <laughs> that's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> and he like second he has a second thought. Yeah, that's a good character, but too bad he dies. Yep. He's murdered. It's too bad. Great principal though. Great school. Love the way school looks. We're still in the era where most high schoolers are played by like 20 something years old. Which yeah, is fine. that's fine. <laughs> these, they're, they're, these people are like really famous, you know what I mean? Like in the yeah. movie. So I feel like horror movies like Friday the 13th and um, Nightmare Before El- on Elm Street and, and Halloween, you know, these movies like feature nobodies, right? Because that's what they yeah. can afford. And Scream is a movie where they get like very, very big actors. I don't know, like what Courtney Cox was probably on Friends at this time, right? 1996 she must have been i feel like i feel like i friends bet she was, was. A thing by then no i think friends was definitely a thing so she's on friends and i think neve campbell was pretty famous too and of course drew barrymore is in the movie like you know these, these are very 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 famous people oh yeah yeah so friends the first season came out in 1994 so by this okay, by courtney yeah. cox is yeah the famous, courtney yeah. cox so yeah but People are out there. They're getting murdered. It has sort of like a Jaws vibe to it at points. Yeah. I don't know why I felt that way. Maybe it's just like with the curfew stuff. I don't know. I really enjoyed all the sort of news anchory, you know, people forcing to close down their shops. Also, just the the way the town looks. The town looks good. I love the way this town looks. It's a great looking town. It's great world building. Like it feels like a real place, which I really like. But it doesn't feel like it's, oh, it's Chicago or LA or whatever. Like it just feels like small town america it's pretty otherworldly it feels it, it feels a little like sometimes like I, I this movie is like of course like very like based in reality but sometimes i do get like a supernatural vibe from it just mm. because the town is really weird the houses are really weird just because they're kind of like there's something off kilter about them yeah i i got more of a vibe on that rewatch it kind of, you know just kind of like a subtle kind of icky kind of thing you know in my opinion no, I can see that. It feels like there's something sort of a little under the surface, a little like Tim Burton, like too clean. You know, like everything's just like kind of too <laughs> yeah, perfect like in the same sense, you and I mean. Yeah, like, yeah. like, like, like in a Pee Wee's uh, Big Adventure, Great Adventure or whatever. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Or like uh, what Edward Scissorhands was probably like yeah. that too. I think I've, I haven't seen that, but I know, I'm know i aware of that. No, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. So many Dutch angles in this movie. Yeah, All a lot of the, the Dutch, Dutch angles. angles. I like when he's like um, centered. And then it switches to a Dutch angle. That is so cool. Yeah. So I like um, to reference the scene where Sydney gets attacked. <coughs> you know, she gets attacked. I think this is before the curfew. She yes. gets attacked. She gets a phone call and then she gets attacked at her home. And like, I love it when it's like you see her like at the door because she's like, she goes in the front porch. She goes back in. She locks her door. And then it's like uh, the shot of her like looking out the window and then a closet a random closet like opens right behind her and it comes out that's such a good scary effective simple clean shot with like the combination of the music too which is great it's just like immediately you're thrust into danger very effectively i think this is one of the things that Wes craven is great with that sometimes it feels cheated especially in the last couple of horror movies i've seen which is Wes craven is willing to do the wide angle you know just like see the yeah, whole thing yeah, he likes and you lot, get to yeah. see him come back he loves it he loves right he loves utilizing the foreground midground and background instead of just like here's a shot of this guy and then here's a shot of a door opening right and it's fine when yeah. they do that but and again i think this has this goes back to his ability to create a sense of space ability to create a sense of here's where this person is here's where that person is yeah and it, it ups the stakes because you know how far away it is right you can see what they can't see and it's not in a way where it feels like it's cheating like you see everything that's going on you feel like you're with this person and you know you're looking behind their back it's wonderful yeah and i think you know and after this scene after she's attacked billy shows up and she's like what the hell like billy and she gets he gets uh he gets thrown in jail i love i love the way he's framed it's because he has a cell phone yeah he, has, he drops a cell phone they're like why do you have a cell phone and why yeah, would he someone gets have arrested. a cell phone good writing you know subverting could he be uh, maybe he's not like why would he get arrested and then like uh, you know and and then she gets a and remember too she's at the house and she gets a call too oh. from Ghostface taunting her and so yeah she um uh she's like well maybe it's not Billy you know she second guesses herself thinking that maybe it's Billy yeah yeah he goes to jail we get to meet the great deputy Dewey 
I love Deputy Right, Dewey. he's great. Yeah, David Arquette. Oh, I forgot about David Arquette. I didn't mention him. He's a great cast member as well. I love it. Just your uh, classic, silly, you know, deputy cop. First first time on the job. Not yeah, really sure great. what he's doing. He's great. Great, laughable character. But he's doing his best. He really is. Yeah, he's a great, lovable character. The movie is pretty, um, I don't know, it's pretty cynical, I would say. In a, in a good way, in a good, fun way. And 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 yeah, do we want him to succeed more than anyone? And he, he kind of he kind of flails a little bit, but he's a great character. He's in all the movies too. Really, he's great. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. There are I some people that. that return again and again. Courtney Cox's character, Neve Campbell's character, okay. David Arquette's character—they all return in all the movies. That's great. I love to hear that. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So curfews are being set. Kids are being forced to go to their homes. And the principal it's time to have a party pre-murdered. Yeah, I love that. They're like, okay, schools, they're going to suspend school due to, you know, the murders. And they're just like, we're going to have a part. Matthew Lillard's like, we're going to party it up. Like, when's a better time? Y- you know, this this party scene at the house, basically, like, I, I, I didn't re- I kind of forgot that basically, like, the f- second half of the movie just completely takes place at this house location. One location. Yep. <laughs> I kind of I kind of completely forgot about that. <laughs> well, I, I didn't forget about it. I just like I was like looking at the runtime and I was like, oh yeah, like this is like pretty much like yeah, like the whole second half of the movie just at yeah. this house location. And it is like one of the greatest like horror set pieces ever. The opening scene and some of the stuff in the middle like are kind of like the run up to this final one pretty much. Because a lot of a lot of crazy stuff happens within this one space. The house is incredible, and it's at Stu's house, I believe. By the way, Stu's house, That's Matthew right. Lillard. Yes. Matthew Lillard, <laughs> <coughs> and they do an incredible job of setting up all the different characters. You know, all the different things they want to do. Of course, Gail Weathers is there to yeah <laughs> to win her Pulitzer Prize because she's gonna catch. Has a has a cheesy tabloid journalist ever won a Pulitzer? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love the motives of everyone. Like they're just so simple and to the point and they're not overly complicated or, no. you know, there's no subtlety to it. And I, I mean that in the best of ways. Like, it's just like, I want to win a Pulitzer Prize or I want to kill people or whatever. That's perfect. Like, that's all you need. You don't need some complicated shit. Yeah. I like, I like, um, like, yeah, like the, the, the motive thing. And remember they're at the, there's that scene at the video store where video they're talking store. to Jamie Kennedy and yeah. what Jamie Kennedy says, he says like, it's the new millennium. It's the millennium. Motives are what I think he says incidental or something yeah. like that. Motives are incidental. Motives are incidental. Like they don't really matter. Like motives, like the motive or reason to kill someone. I was thinking about this. It's like, like, like within the new millennium, um, horror movie, you know, the mid nineties horror movie motives, uh, you know, uh, uh, don't matter anymore. <laughs> right. The horror movie has transcended to the point where the reason why a person goes nuts and kills and stabs a bunch of person in a movie, they've transcended the, the need for a motive. <laughs> and I, I like that discussion. And uh, obviously the, the killers in the movie do have um, uh, specific motives as it's revealed by the end of the movie. But yeah, just kind of like the discussion of like uh, uh, horror films and what does a horror film contain? What does it need? What doesn't it need? You know, I like that stuff. I think that writing is good. Sometimes the writing, once again, kind of gets me a little, you know, annoyed. Maybe not annoyed, just kind of like, I don't know, maybe maybe makes me cringe a little bit, but uh-huh. that kind of stuff I like. I kind of li- I like that bit right there. No, I really in- enjoyed that. Also, I love seeing video stores. I really miss video stores. Like I, I miss, love the video I store miss too. The video store there is so good. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of like what's another good video store in a movie. I'm trying to think. There's a blockbuster by our house that I would go to all the time as a kid. You probably went to that one a lot too. Yeah, we probably went to the one by that uh, Chinese restaurant, like Walk and Roll. It where that uh Kroger, or no, it was a Marsh. It was like in front it of was a, a marsh. marsh. Yeah, of course. It was uh, across the street from the Pizza Hut. Yeah. Yep, cross your pizza. <laughs> I would get video games and yeah, movies there all the time. Mostly video games, but I I do remember getting like videos and DVDs there a lot. I was there every Friday. I don't know about every week. I mean, it was it was a decent amount. I can't remember though. I'm trying to remember like what movie I would get there a lot. I don't remember, but I do remember what it looked like inside. You know, like being oh, in there. 
I love Blockbuster. But yeah, the video store of the movie looks great. It sure does. Yeah, and uh, the Jamie Kennedy character is a lot of fun, too, I think. He, he's fun. He's in the second movie. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. So they're at the house. Everyone's setting up their their own shit. They're getting ready for mm-hmm. the night. We learn mm-hmm. that the video feed that uh, Courtney Cox, Gail Weathers, has set up is 30 seconds off. There's a little bit of a lag. Right, she's like watching them. Yeah. She's watching them watch TV. <laughs> yeah, they're watching a... I don't know what horror movie they're watching. They're watching Halloween. Oh, are they? Okay. Yeah. So they're watching Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that's when we get that famous scene. Where we learned the three rules. Right, he did. Lies we, yeah, tell Every horror movie. Yeah, he yeah. does the thing. Matthew Lillard, Lillard disappears. And of course, they do a that really great cut between watching the kids downstairs watching the horror movie and Prescott, our, our female lead character, having sex. It's like a it's right. the perfect, it's the perfect edit. I love it. It's weird. They're like watching the movie and the movie is kind of telegraphing stuff that's happening in the movie as well that you that you the viewer <laughs> are watching. Yeah. But also the the news people like Gail Weathers and the camera guy are also watching them watch the movie too. So it's kind of like intercutting the halt between all these things that are happening. And you also have like David Arquette and Courtney Cox that go do something as well. They're just like a lot of like cutting between like a bunch of different things that are happening. And of course, even before that, Rose McGowan's character gets killed very brutally. Where, uh, uh, I like kill. that scene in the garage. Once again, that scene just happens in the garage, but it feels like so that's great because like that would be really scary if you're stuck in a garage, which I think everyone is familiar with a garage. You've yeah. been in a garage that doesn't have any cars <laughs> in it. You know the size of it and how like scary it would be if there was another person in there that wanted to kill you. And that would be really fucking scary and i love like yeah she tries to like shove herself through like the the, the cat the, door the, the, or the dog door. door yeah whatever yeah and and yeah it just fuck and yeah he, he she dies in the most brutal way maybe the most brutal way out of all these people oh yeah very intense murder great scene love it and i will say i have to mention it you know rose mcgowan being the movie does kind of have this sense of like uh you know of course rose mcgowan she later you know came out as um you know, uh, uh, against Harvey Weinstein, the Weinsteins, yeah. you know, being sexually assaulted by them. Who, of course, produced this film. They produced this movie, Miramax, they yeah. produced this movie. So there's obviously that aspect to the movie. And I'm not I'm not trying to say, like, oh, it adds to it or whatever, <laughs> you know, because obviously those are actual, like, real people and real shit that happen. Yeah. But it is kind of like a weird, it is kind of like a weird sick quality to it, too. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, this... Uh, female characters in Scream and in other horror movies, they're kind of like sacrificed on the altar of of film or whatever. As in real life, you know, they were also probably, you know, given up as well to, you know, these, uh, you know, to the Weinsteins in particular. So, uh, you know, I'm not trying to say like, oh, you know, oh, <laughs> you know, but it is kind of like an aspect to it where it's unfortunate that it has to be a part of it, but it is, you know, it's kind of unavoidable. Yeah. It's woven into the complex intertextuality of this film. Especially in a movie that is already very, like you said, intertextual. Absolutely. But a great murder. I mean, murder via garage door. Did not expect that one. (laughs) Yeah. I love it. And it telegraphs to you right away, right? Because a cat jumps through the door. So it it, it tells you, remember? It shows you like, oh, by the way, there's a cat door right there. And it's a pretty big one too. Like a person could fit in. A great little foreshadow, which Wes yeah. Craven again is great at is just adding like these little things like before it happens, like, oh shit, like that's that's what's gonna happen, and you get it. Even like scene like minutes, seconds, and even like scenes before something yeah. happens too. Another wonderful kill. But of course, after this all goes down, no one notices, by the way. Like no one walks by the garage for quite a while. Like they all Yeah, I guess yeah. It's fine. They I mean it doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> But Gail Weathers and Dewey go out because they are looking for a car. They heard there was a car in the bushes. So they got to go look out for this car. And while this is happening, of course, they're watching a movie and uh, Prescott's having sex. They're all doing these things simultaneously. And then, of course, Dewey finds the car. And one of the main suspects, of course, is Prescott's Cindy's father. father. Cindy's father. Yeah. And they find the car and they're like, oh, shit, he's here. Shit's about to go down. Shit's, yeah. shit's about to get real. And I think that's when we get the the almost murder 
yeah yeah of billy, ghostface billy, with billy, the, billy is black, like stabbed yeah. right yeah and at this point too of course you're thinking like oh shit like it wasn't billy who the fuck could it be you know yeah they kill billy and, and a lot of people have left the yep. party now and so it's only like a handful of people there and they kill billy and he uh she like uh sydney like runs out and she tries to uh um like uh find the cameraman and he's killed brutally and she like escapes as well through the van and dewey is stabbed right like he's stabbed in the back like everyone gets stabbed and yeah and just like there's just like like all this shit and i think like um right gail tries to leave right to in the van and then yeah. sydney is like in the way and she like crashes like all this stuff is happening like really quickly and it's just it's just it's just an, exci- an exciting it's just so exciting and fun to see a million things are happening all at once and by the way going back to that moment where billy is killed right before he's killed yeah and his girlfriend are having that argument and he gives arguably the best line reading um, what do i have to tell like how do i have to show you that i'm not a yeah. killer what do i have to do it's so like, good <laughs> it's so creep so fucking creepy like the way he delivers that line like clearly he's a killer it's but then he gets stabbed so you're like wait what then he gets stabbed. it can't be him no it can't be him no uh, and then he like i love how he like he i like how he like pretends to roll down the stairs yes. do you remember that he throws he himself stabbed. down the stairs he like throws himself down the stairs and then jamie kennedy shows up too what oh jamie kennedy and Stu matthew lillard they're like oh it's they have like like that i love yeah, that back and forth that, that they have together fun. where they're like and, and she's like fuck both of you and she goes inside the house and i think jamie kennedy comes back again right and then they do that great like zoom in on Billy where he like looks super evil yes. and he shoots him. Oh, it's so good. I I love that shit, dude. I love it. And that that's when we learn the reveal. That ghost faces two people. Yeah, great. I was fucking blown away. I was so surprised. I yeah, you didn't I know it was no two idea. people? No idea at all. I was I was blown away. <laughs> Truly. It's so it's so like and it's really like the two obvious characters in a way. Yeah. Like they're the two most <laughs> unhinged is. characters in the whole movie. Obviously, yep. you have Jamie Kennedy's character. He's kind of like a ringer because he's like a movie horror guy. Yeah. And so kind of like, you know, Ghostface, you know, when he talks to his victims, he he's kind of talks the same way. So you're thinking, like, is he like and then and then everybody else is like, oh no, it's Sydney's dad because it's been a year anniversary or whatever. So there's a lot of like ringers to keep you second guessing yourself. But ultimately, it does end up being the two most unhinged, clearly the most two most unhinged and evil looking characters in the movie. Yeah. And that's why it's it's perfect. It's there's some sort of line that I can't think of where something about, I don't know, the the greatest plot twist is when the most unexpected thing is the most expected thing something to that degree but yeah some yeah it can be yeah like what's the most unexpected thing is that they are the exact people who you thought they were at the beginning which is great yeah. like it's like you yeah. knew it the whole time but then also no idea i loved it i i was blown away i, I couldn't have been more happy at that moment yeah and, and Stu, Stu, and billy are great like the 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 way that they like talk to each the way that they it's talk to say about the plan they're so scary and they have to do that like crazy scene where they have to stab each other because their plan <laughs> is that like they'll stab Sydney because they have her dad. They have her dad tied up. So they're going to like stab Sydney as if her father stabbed her and her father like shot himself. But Stu and Billy, they'll be stabbed up and like almost dead but they won't be dead they'll they'll get out you know they'll still be alive so they have to like stab each other the the, the great moment and yeah i love like when he he like stabs Stu and he's like bleeding everywhere and he's like oh i'm feeling kind of (laughs) woozy it's a great acting it's a great moment and then of course you get their motives right the right yeah (laughs) the silly motive of the father sleeping with the mother and you know his mommy leaving him and all of that and then of course matthew lillard's motive it's peer pressure. I love that. He's just a crazy person. <laughs> He's an excitable person. <laughs> <laughs> and send, but send I love too. Yeah. When he's on yeah. the phone. Yeah. One thing that I like about Wes Craven movies, and he does he does this a lot, I've noticed. He does it on all the screen movies. He does it in his Nightmare before uh, Nightmare and Elm Street movies. And he also does it in, in another movie that I watch called Red Eye. And I think even in another movie too. At, at the end of the movies, in the final act of the movie. The, the the lead character, the main character is suddenly given this like 
confidence and power and they kind of like take control of the situation yeah. and they fight back. It happens quite a bit in Wes Craven movies when it doesn't happen too often in horror movies. And in this movie, it definitely happens where Sydney kind of like rises to the occasion and she helps her dad and she fights back against them in a very, um, uh, I want to say powerful way. It's a very, um, um, almost an inspiring way where she's yeah. able to kind of like fight back against these insane people. And it's, uh, <laughs> It's very fun, you know, because it, it, it kind of like seeing a character kind of be helpless and just kind of run around. It's fine, but I, I think it's also really fun to see kind of like the Vic whose friends keep getting killed, her kind of like rise to the occasion and you'll fight back against them. And that's what happens here. Yeah, it's very satisfying. Like you feel empowered kind of as you were saying. Yeah. But also just that that sense of satisfaction of like, we did it like we did the thing like we fought like it's not just like oh we ran away because that always kind of feels a little cheap like a little cheating but with Wes Craven it's like ah oh, they got back right they killed him and of course there's that great moment where she twists things around she moves things around she calls them on the phone and yeah <laughs> and I, I love when Matthew Lillard's on the phone and he's like, did you call the police? She's like, I already called yeah. them. He's like, my parents are going to be so bad at me. Yeah, that scene is so good. That line is so good because it's just, it kind of sums up the movie too, where it's like, yeah, it's just, I don't know. Like, it just kind of sums up like, yeah, I don't know. It's just like they're kids, right? Like they're like high school kids. And it kind of just sums up how they want to make themselves like feel uh, more powerful than they are they want to feel uh, uh like they're like they want to feel like michael myers or jason Voorhees. but at the end of the day they're kind of just like annoying like little kids but of course then we get that great moment where cindy stabs him right in the with the umbrella yeah. right she just <laughs> runs umbrella, out of the she's, yeah she's wearing great. the scream costume and everything i love it right yeah she's like using their tools against them and then people keep coming through the door trying to kill them which is great <laughs> being pushed back <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 like like i think gail shows up and oh yeah there she, gail comes in to try to shoot them but she yeah. stopped and then she comes in again and i think what she uh i think she shoots someone the boyfriend yeah it's and he takes the gun then she shoots him in the head <laughs> that's great yeah they do that little again another meta contextual thing we're like well now there's going to be the moment where he comes back one last time yeah that one last scream and then he just shoots her in the head. It's great. Yeah. I think <laughs> Stu is killed because the TV falls on his, on his head. Yeah. If I'm remembering throw a TV correctly. on him. Yeah. Yeah. Right out of, right out of uh, Gross Point Blank. Or, yeah. 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 That happens in the movie? Yeah. Yeah. He kills someone with a, with a TV. That happens in um, uh, one of the, the uh, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movies as well, where he, he turns into a TV and he picks up a kid and he shoves the kid into the TV. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. I love that. But Scream is killed. How does Matthew... Oh, Matthew Lillard just dies because he's been stabbed so many times. Yeah, the TV falls on him. He's been stabbed. Like oh, yeah, 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 just, yeah, I think yeah, he just yeah. dies, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be dead. And they're all dead. And then Dewey lives. Yeah, like I said, Dewey lives. Uh, Gail is okay. Sydney is okay. Everybody is pretty much okay. And the movie just kind of ends. You know, it doesn't really... Uh, there's no, like, epilogue or anything like that where it's like... Uh, Sydney's at back back of the school and she's sad or whatever. You know, she's with her and her dad are reunited. You know, it's like there's not really any like big scene like that. It just kind of ends. Yeah, it's great. You know, I like Scream. I was thinking about this. You know, Scream is kind of cool because it's like it kind of like feels like, like I said, as we talked about, it's a meta textual movie. It's commenting on other horror movies. Characters in the movie are aware of other horror movies. It kind of feels as if like the characters in the movie are kind of like stuck in this feedback loop where they're aware of horror movies and, it, and it's as if they've entered one you know yeah. and they're kind of stuck right in the rules but also the they're they're kind of stuck in in, in in this kind of like cycle of of of, of killings and mm -hmm. of a horror movie sort of and that's kind of like what i was talking about with kind of like the supernatural element it almost kind of feels like a spell has been put on these characters and these people where they're kind of like now stuck in the confines of a horror movie narrative and they must kind of like escape it somehow, but they can't escape it yet. So innocent people like Rose McGowan and stuff and Drew Barrymore, uh, they just get, you know, stabbed and killed <laughs> and, and they're sacrificed as part of this kind of like, I don't know, feedback loop ritual of mm -hmm. being in a horror film. 
and and you know like i said the ending is you know Sidney prescott fighting back against it subverting it that's kind of how i see it no i i feel that and i really enjoyed this movie i mean i'm not a huge horror fan horror for me can be a little hit or miss of course i see a nightmare on elm street loved it so it's grim i had some high expectations i know how much you love scream had no idea i mean i knew the the basics of the film of course i knew all kind of the the jokes and the textual stuff and all that kind of stuff and yet even knowing all that it's so good i mean it just looks yeah it's a great movie it's a fantastic looking movie the lighting is great everyone in it is fantastic no one takes anything too seriously but then at the same time like they're all doing great jobs in their performances with craven he fucking directs the hell out of this everything about this is absolutely amazing i mean, i loved every second of it so i'm gonna have to give it a very strong eight out of ten i feel the same way i'm gonna give it a strong edit at eight out of ten too i'm almost bordering on a nine here i've seen it many times yeah and it's very tempting to give it one but i don't know sometimes like um i don't know i just it, for some reason i just can't do it yet but yeah i mean i've seen it quite a few times and i think i will see it countless more times you know it's just <laughs> yeah. it's just a really good well-constructed horror film and i think anyone can enjoy it though like it's not too yeah it winks a lot mm -hmm. and if you get it and you're in the know that's cool but if you're not i don't think it's the end of the world i think you'll still really enjoy it like the movie was super successful and i doubt every single person that saw it knew every reference got every reference right like so obviously there's something going on there that's outside of all like the you know meta elements or whatever so and in that case you know it it shows how good the how well directed the movie is great cast great vibes you know it's just a solid horror film you know just so yeah uh, eight out of ten for sure i will say too uh i watched scream 2 and scream 2 i forgot about this well i kind of i remember this but i forgot how soon it happens mm -hmm. With the sequels, with the second, third, and fourth movie, what happens is, and they and they introduce it right at the beginning of Scream Two. What happens is, is that in the universe of the Scream movies, they start producing movies called the Stab movies, which are <laughs> movies that are based off of the events of the first Scream movie. And so the people go to a movie theater to see the Stab movie, and the first scene of the Stab movie is just a recreation of the first scene of the Scream movie, except it's like a different person. Like it's an actor awesome. in the movie. Yeah. And then as the sequels go along, there are also sequels of the Stab movies and stuff, and they comment on sequels and horror sequels. So it just like keeps going, going and going and going. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. All right, y'all. Thank you for listening. You can find everything I do at Austin Lugo 1 2. I'm on Letterboxd at Retro Andrew, R A T R 0 Andrew. And you can find this podcast wherever you hear podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Theater42 or With Nothing to Say. And thank you all for listening. Thank you again. Thank you.